Hi, welcome back to Advanced Software Engineering. Today we're going to talk about dependability. For the first half of the course, we were more concerned with all the project management chapters, all the things you have to do during project management, estimation metrics, and so on and so forth. For the second half, we're going to focus more on software qualities. And one overarching quality that has a lot of sub-qualities is dependability. So in this little lecture, we're just going to clarify some of the terminology that we will be using. So the sub-characteristics. of dependability characteristics are availability is the system up and running and then reliability if I give the system the same input am I gonna get the same output as last time can I trust that system and then safety. Is the system safe to use or is there potential that it could harm somebody or something? Security. Is my information safe in the system or are they going to lose it to some hacker who comes along? And resilience. If the system is under significant attack, how well can it resist? How quickly can it recover? And how soon is it going to be reinstated and can it provide critical services all the time during the attack. So we're going to deal with each of those sub-characteristics in subsequent lectures. But one thing they have all in common. So far we've mainly been talking about technical systems, about software intensive systems. But when you've done a really good job at engineering good software, and then you put it out into the wild and you know you, you really didn't make mistakes. And then the second day customers start calling and they're like, well, this thing doesn't do what it's supposed to do. A lot of the time we will find, and maybe you've been in that place, I've certainly been in that place, where it turns out the problem was sitting in front of the computer. The problem was not in the computer. So there is some mistake in how the user tried to use the program as opposed to a mistake in the program or an error in the program. Now, if we want to capture that in our analysis and in the way of how we talk about software systems, we now speak about socio-technical systems. Let's say because human operator context is important. Is important for all these quality characteristics up here. Now, there are specific methods of how we deal with safety and security and pretty much any of these sub-characteristics. But there are two principles that we can use across all of them that will always increase the dependability of our system. And those two principles are redundancy and diversity. Redundancy means I don't only have one version of that database backend because if that one ever gets cut off, then I'm in big trouble or if that gets compromised. So instead, I want to have a backup server somewhere. So when I run my critical services and I see there is a problem with the main server, I can just switch to the backup server version. So redundancy is almost like I have clones of parts of my systems. 
And then diversity means what if the way how I calculated it went wrong? There are a couple of famous examples in software systems history where mm, a satellite that had to fly somewhere crashed into the surface of a planet because one supplier worked in miles and the other supplier worked in kilometers, so the imperial bear system, metric system. And in some programming languages, you do not have the units. So for example, a lot of the space travel things are programmed in Fortran, and Fortran doesn't denote units. And so when you have NASA, who is working with the metric system, using a US supplier, and many US suppliers still work with the imperial system, then you may have a mismatch there. So what you do with diversity instead is to prevent things like that. I mean, to prevent things like that, you obviously also need a good code review and need to properly document your code and your specifications. But to prevent calculation errors of any sort, we try to introduce diversity. And that means we are going to calculate uh, the result in two different ways. We're going to do that on two different paths, maybe using two different programming languages to make sure that we get to the correct result. So we'll compare the results of the two different ways of computing it, and only if they agree, we're going to proceed. So they are going to be some kind of mutant version of an algorithm. And they run in parallel, and then we compare the results. And that's going to increase the dependability of my system because I know, all right, those two different ways of getting to the result both got us to the same result. So we're pretty sure that it's the right thing to do. We don't only want to be able to depend on our software. We also want to be able to depend on our processes. So when we talk about dependable processes, we switch perspective a little. We are now not talking about the software system we are engineering. We are talking about the process that we use to engineer the software system. What could make a software development process dependable? Let's say you've been running a little software company for five years. You have 10 developers under you. And what's your what does your process look like? You hopefully don't start from scratch every time and like try to figure it out. No, by now, after five years, you will hopefully have established a standard process that you go through. It's repeatable because it's written down somewhere, it's documented, and you're measuring things so you can do quality assurance with your process. Those are the characteristics of dependable processes. can perform some quality assurance. And then last but not least, towards the end of the chapter, we'll look a little bit into formal methods. Because a lot of the systems that we will have to deal with are safety critical or security relevant to some extent. And we can do a bunch of testing for all of our systems. But if you remember Edgar Dijkstra, he said, testing can only ever show the presence of bugs. It cannot prove that there are no bugs left. So therefore, if we want to make sure that our system is error free, what we need to do instead is verification. And a lot of verification is done with formal methods. What was the other half of the verification that often goes hand in hand? Validation. Validation is usually what we do with the customer. So we validate with the customer, is this really what you wanted? And we verify against the specification, is this implemented exactly as we said we we're going to implement it? Is it going to fulfill the constraints that we said need to be on there for safety and security reasons? And are we 
uh, going to be able to prove that. And the ways how to prove that are often formal methods. And the reason why we only want to use formal methods when we have safety or security relevant systems is because they are very cost intensive. So I wouldn't want to use it for, for my next little app game on my phone because it doesn't matter if that one crashes. But I would certainly want to make sure if I'm going to step into that airplane that takes me somewhere, I want to make sure it's going to get there and not um, have any incidents in between just because it wasn't properly verified. So for those high risk systems, we want to employ formal methods to make sure that they're perfectly safe and secure.